So just to quickly run through the agenda, the presentation this evening is divided into four main components. First, we're gonna take a look back. We're gonna go back and look at the journey it took us to reach to the point that we're at um, this evening. Next, we're gonna focus on the vision for the proposed um, and planned downtown area for the city. Third, we're gonna look at the data overview, which is of course the traffic analysis that has been completed by our consultant. And finally, we're gonna close with next steps. So we thought that this slide was very important to bring to the forefront because a lot of times we forget that the journey that we've been on, right? So I titled this slide, The Road to Our Downtown. And the, the road to our downtown, really it's been decades in the making. Um, we spent decades acquiring multiple parcels in the downtown area and to the point where we've amassed about 30 acres currently between the city and the CRA. Um, over the last 12 to 13 years, we've spelt, spent um, time collaborating with multiple stakeholders, whether it's the city commission or CRA leadership or advisory committees, the economic development council, city and CRA staff, or the chamber of commerce. So when I say we've laid the framework, we had to really ready the area for redevelopment. And what I mean by redevelopment is, as a government, we're always looking to partner with the, the private sector because we are certainly responsible for investing in the public components, such as the roadway and streetscape improvements, but we always like to bring the private sector in to introduce new amenities for our residents to enjoy, um, as well as housing and office space, and I'll hit on that a little bit later. So I just wanted to take a quick point. I think it's important to go through all of these steps. You certainly can't. It's probably difficult to read from the screen, so I'm just gonna quickly take the opportunity to go through the list. Um, we had a downtown charrette back in 2008. Um, in 2010, we adopted a connectivity plan for the downtown area. Also in 2010, we began the design and planning process for our cultural center. In 2011, the Northwest CRE underwent a massing and zoning analysis for the area. And in 2013, we adopted a downtown Pompano transit-oriented um, land use and overlay district um, plan for the, for the downtown area as well. In 2015, we completed our beautiful streetscape improvements on Martin Luther King Jr. Boulevard. And in 2016, we completed um, streetscape improvements in Old Town, as well as completing our Civic Plaza and Fire Fountain area. Then in 2017, we completed the construction of our beautiful cultural center across the street from City Hall. And during that time, we also adopted an East Transit um, oriented corridor um, plans for the area as well. In between 2015 and 18, we really started to discuss making some major improvements to the Atlantic Boulevard and Dixie Highway intersection. And actually in 2021, um, phase one construction for that area got underway and it, that runs from McNabb Road all the way up to Southwest 2nd Street. So that was phase one of the planned improvements to Dixie at Atlantic. So well, I think we can all agree that we're missing a number of key components in our planned downtown area. We don't have a defined gateway or entrance for the area currently. Um, the area lacks connectivity and walkability. Um, Dixie and Atlantic is a major intersection um, connecting all of our downtown areas, the, the planned air, downtown area. And I'm gonna actually show you a map in a few minutes so you can actually have a visual of what we're referring to when we talk about the downtown area. So again, we have a lot of competing forces utilizing that intersection today. It is definitely being used. We have the train, two trains actually. We have vehicles, we have cyclists, we have regular pedestrians, and we also have our school children that are crossing on their way to school in the mornings and in the afternoons when um, school gets dismissed. So we have a lot of competing forces competing for attention um, in that intersection, and we really have to work together to harmonize all of those interests. We don't really in the downtown currently have a lot of activated areas uh, where people feel free to traverse and enjoy themselves. We don't have a lot of opportunities for people to socialize. Um, I think we can all agree that the untapped event that we hold um, once a month, it's, it's fantastic, it's successful, it's an out, out, outdoor venue, however, and we are lacking a lot of brick and mortar establishments such as restaurants, drinking establishments, retail, multi additional multifamily, particularly workforce housing, and also we're lacking office space. And of course, with office space, introduces the concept of additional jobs that our residents can have access to as well. 
So I just want you to bear with me right now. So when we talk about the downtown, it's really an experience, right? We've coined the phrase, Florida's warmest welcome. It's how you feel when you're here. So the next few slides are going to try to get you to envision yourself in what we see that downtown to be and how you can traverse through it and enjoy yourself with your friends and your family. So if you would envision that you leave your home and you're able to walk into the downtown or you've had a difficult day at work and now you want to walk into the downtown and meet up with friends. You may enjoy dinner by the fire fountain or uh, along Northeast First Avenue. And this is actually a conceptual rendering. Um, it's along Flagler Avenue. It's looking south, southeast. So you see the widened sidewalks, the beautiful paved streets, people traversing the fire fountain, enjoying themselves. And it's difficult to see. But if you look at the top left of the screen, you can actually see the roof of the cultural center. Or perhaps you want to have dinner and socialize in Old Town's backyard. And as the commission is aware, it's currently under construction and we have a, a number of eating establishments that are planned for the area. Uh, perhaps after dinner, you want to pop into Baca and you want to see a new art exhibit or you want to walk to the Allied Cultural Center and enjoy an intimate outdoor concert. Um, perhaps um, you want to cross Atlantic Boulevard after we've made these significant improvements to the area to make it safe to cross, of course. But perhaps you want to cross Atlantic Boulevard and you want to take in a performance at the Cultural Center. This is actually another conceptual rendering. It's just to give you perspective. It's looking south down Northeast First Avenue. Um, the Cultural Center is at the, bottom, the top of the screen um, to the left. So again, you see the beautiful landscaping, the widened sidewalks, and again, just a great area for people to tra traverse through safely. Once you've finished enjoying your show at the Cultural Center, you may want to cross back into Old Town and finish off your evening with a beverage and a dessert with your friends and talk about your experience at the Cultural Center. And finally, Maybe at the end of your work day, you just want to walk home because you've been working in that new downtown. I talked before about introducing office space into the new downtown area. Or after that fantastic evening that I just described, you're able to walk from the downtown back to your home. So this is um, our downtown, the proposed area. So I'm just going to go through the three key areas that I'm talking about. So the first area that's highlighted in pink, that's um, the quadrant. It's located between Dixie Highway and I-95, and then between Atlantic Boulevard and Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Boulevard. Across the street to the east of Dixie Highway, highlighted now in yellow, that's Old Town. So that's also part of our planned downtown area. And finally, at the lower right of your screen, this is the current site for the Cultural Center and City Hall. So I, you know, we talked earlier about all the issues with the downtown. I think one of the things that I want to point out here too is that, you know, the decision to have our downtown here, one, it's ideally located next to I-95. Two, it's ideally located next to the county's bus transit center and also next to the planned commuter rail, rail station, which is planned for Pompano Beach in the future. But what you can see on the screen is that there's a major intersection there, Atlantic Boulevard and Dixie Highway. And it's really going to serve as the framework and the entrance into our downtown. It's really going to be the grid that connects all of the areas I'm showing on the screen currently, but not in its current condition. And um, one of the things, let me see what point I wanted to make here. Excuse me. So, you know, all of these improvements that we're recommending, the whole impetus here is to transform this intersection, to make it walkable, to make it safe. And to do that, the city of Pompano Beach, as a government entity, our main fiduciary responsibility is public safety. So I talked about all those competing interests previously. I talked about the vehicles, the trains, the pedestrians, the school children, the crossing guards. And we, again, we're just trying to uh, find a way to make this project um, be in harmony for all of those stakeholders involved in using this intersection, both the ones that are using it currently and the ones that will traverse it in the future once the downtown area is completed. And that's going to take an investment from the city. Um, you know, we had to develop a finance plan for the project. And 
I want to talk a little bit about striking while, while the iron's hot. Because as, as a city, you know, we're always trying to do all of these major impro improvements to improve the quality of life of our residents here in the city. But again, that takes dollars. And we're always trying to find ways to do it in a way that it's the most cost effective and that it doesn't result in raising additional taxes for existing residents. So we were very proud because we actually um, participated in Broward County's um, surtax program, the Penny Surtax, that passed back in 2018. And I'm happy to report that the Dixie Highway project was ranked very highly by the Metropolitan Planning um, Organization based on our streetscape design and based on the fact that it would increase mobility, reduce congestion here in the city. We were actually awarded $25 million for this project. So we were one of the, the highest um, projects awarded out of the 30 cities in Broward County that's competing for this circuits, um, surtax fund. And that was... I'd like to take some... <laughs> ladies and gentlemen, ladies, ladies and gentlemen. Okay, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Okay, I know everybody has an opinion on this, but please be courteous. Let us get through this presentation without outbursts and without applause or, or cat calls or anything else. Please, I, I, I just, everybody, please be courteous. That's all I ask, okay? You'll, everybody will have their time to talk. Don't worry. Thank you. Appreciate it. Go ahead, Ms. Sybil. So again, we, we want to strike when the iron's hat. We compete hot. We competed for that funding among 30 other cities in Broward County. We were ranked very high on the list, meaning that we're going to start to get funded for the project in 2022. And again, it was an, a, attributed to being shovel ready for the project and showing them all of the framework and plans that we've laid out over decades to get us to this point. Another thing that's important to mention in terms of striking while the iron's hot is the federal government just passed an infrastructure bill. We've been working very closely with our federal lobbyists. There's a lot of money in that bill for infrastructure and bridges. And again, we're working closely to, to apply as well for additional funding through that infrastructure bill process. So again, this is the time the funding is there, both on the county surtax side and on the federal side as well. So we really want to move forward with fulfilling the vision for a new downtown. Um, the, one of the reasons we try to invest um, in, in the public sector as well is we're trying to attract private investment. The city plans, the CRA plans to move forward, excuse me, in the next few weeks with issuing a request for proposals. And the whole point of doing that is to just try to secure a master developer to assist in redeveloping the area. Because I talked earlier about public investment, but we're also talking about the private sector coming in and being able to make things vertical in terms of the restaurants, the retail, the office space, the residential. And I think there's an educational component as well that we've been working on um, through this um, project. So again, very important things to note. The reason why we want the private sector to come in is not just to provide the additional amenities and improve quality of life, but we also look at things like this from an economic impact standpoint. You've all seen what happened on the beach. We invested our public dollars. The private sector came in and invested as well. Um, we generated not just parking revenues, but we expanded our tax base. And what do I mean by that? It means that when, we, when new construction comes into the city, it adds to new taxes coming in, and that means that that produces additional revenues that we're not burdening our existing residents and businesses with. We're creating new taxes, and we're able to then parlay those taxes to provide additional services and new programs for our residents, whether it's keeping our parks and recreation fees lower um, for recreation activities and athletic programs. These are all things, or being able to afford to hire an additional firefighter, an additional police officer through BSO. These types of private investments allows us to parlay those additional dollars and add and improve the, continue to improve the quality of life of our existing residents. Um, so just in summarizing my slide here, um, again, you know, the downtown is walkable now. We do have existing amenities in Old Town. We have the Cultural Center, we have Baca, we have Ally Cultural Center. Um, but it's all walkable, but I think the takeaway um, here is it's simply not safe. Uh, we cannot move forward with redeveloping and visualizing our new downtown without fixing this intersection. It is a key component and it truly is trans transformative and it's a catalyst for us to continue to move forward um, with this project and realize our new downtown. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Paul. Very good. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Kissinger, just identify yourself, please. Yes, Paul Kissinger, Kissinger Design. Um, good to be back. So one of the things that I want to I want to tag on to, to to Suzette, it's not only the intersection 
Um, it's the whole character of the street. I've talked about that on several different occasions. But, I mean, this is what's out there. And I've heard a lot of comments about who would walk out there. It's unsafe. There's prostitutes out there. There's homeless and all those kinds of things. And part of what, what I then think of is how is that an attainable situation for a city? How, how is that kind of condition um, appropriate for a city when you have a blighted neighborhood? And that's what cities do is to redevelop areas so that we don't have those kinds of conditions. And changing the character of the street is equally as important as changing the character of this intersection. I do want to point out, though, it's not going to be a local road where it's only a few lanes. We're, we're talking, it's still a major intersection. It is going to continue to be a major intersection, but there are ways that we can improve that so it's certainly safety and helps change the character of the street. So this is the existing conditions that we had prior to the putting the delineators out in October of 2021. That's what, that was what's out there when we first got started. The delineators were installed and on the, on the screen you can see all the yellow, little yellow lines and the or, um, orange dots, which is the delineators, that begin to try to tell people which way that they're supposed to, do, uh, sp supposed to go. Um, the delineators is actually a way in which we can create or simulate what the final conditions will be. And I want to emphasize the word simulate because we can't do exactly what's going to be out there because we'd have to do all the construction. And so if you look at what's out there, and I know all of you out here are very familiar with, with Outseer, that's why you're here tonight, it's a maze. It's a maze, it's confusing, um, it's, it's, it's not fun to drive, no one likes to sit in traffic, um, but there are certainly some pros in order to using delineators instead of doing construction. So for example, if we had started with construction and we found out that it wasn't working, we would have to demolish what we were doing and then reconstruct. We don't want to waste money, that doesn't make any sense, and that makes life difficult for everybody. Um, so the loosely stimulating, simulating the, the traffic patterns is so very important. Um, the next thing that it allows us to do is to test the various different improvements that we want to make to it. We thought when we first did the design work that we had a very solid plan. It got implemented, as you've heard me say, not the way that we typically would do something like this. So we've been playing catch up since October. But what that has, a, that period from October, uh, and it's unfortunate it has taken so long, but these things unfortunately do take some time, as we've been able to go ahead and put elements back in related to turning motions and changing delineators, and most importantly, although not physically seen, there's been a tremendous amount of change to rate to the timings of the light. And I'm gonna speak a little bit about what Joaquin's gonna say, which is the power of two seconds. So the power of two seconds is when you come up to a light and it's yellow or sometimes we say orange, it's not really red yet, but if you said, if I had two more seconds, I could get through that. So for every two seconds, you change on the, on the duration of a green, you can push one more car per lane. So when you make changes of two, four, eight, 10, 12 seconds, multiplied by the various lanes, and you look at the number of times those cycles go through, I know I'm stealing some of your thund thunder here, <laughs> um, but when you go through those cycles um, uh, in an hour, which is 25 in our case, you begin to have a, an exponential number of cars that you can push through an intersection um, uh, just by changing some seconds. So Joaquin's gonna talk a little bit more about that in more detail, but the power of two seconds is very important. So we've been able to look at the holistic system of Dixie and Atlantic and Cypress and First and all those things that come together uh, make the traffic flow better. The cons, the cons. <laughs> the cons related to, sim, to uh, using delineators. It's a maze. It can be confusing. Um, one of the things that is a, a function of 
uh, delineators is there's something that's called side friction. Um, and a very typical urban design uh, methodology in which we're incorporating here in the final design is narrowing down the perception of a roadway. So, for example, you might have a very long driveway, let's say, to your house. You're probably not going to go 50 miles per hour because it's narrow and there's a short distance. Um, but when you're on 95 and you have 12-foot lanes or 13-foot lanes, you're, you're going to get up to 100. So the perception of having a narrower space in which to drive slows traffic down. Now, when you use delineators, you're actually putting a vertical barrier. I mean, I don't know about you, but I hate driving next to the Jersey Bears on 95. I mean, just, you're just kind of like this the whole time. Um, and the same thing happens with delineators is that side friction, uh, what it's called. And so what that's like essentially doing is it's calming traffic times two. We're not trying to calm traffic times two. We're trying to calm traffic. And so that's another one of the cons of using the delineators because you're putting those delineators right on the striping and you have boxed in that driver and then now I'm driving through a maze and I'm not really sure what, what way I'm supposed to go. So I'm having to make that indecision. And remember what I said about the power of two seconds? So I just slow down a few miles per hour. Boom, that's another car. Somebody else does it, that's another car. Somebody else does it, it's another car. That's why things begin to stack up. So the other thing that's important um, to note is that the, the delineators that are out there now are not going to be what the final solution will be. Um, we're not going to, as for, for example, on the westbound lane of Atlantic that then turns south on Dixie. When you're out there right now, it's median, lane, delineators, and another in a through lane. So we would never do a median, a lane, and another median. We're going to take that space that's to the north of that turn lane and put that space into the median. Now, in order to, to simulate that, we had to do it the way we did because we didn't have to do construction. We didn't have to do any demolition. But when we do the final construction, all that will be combined so that side friction goes away. That's a big important, uh, big, important point as it relates to the delineators. So this is the modifications that we did in December. I think one of the things that I heard in October and I heard in December was we need a plan B. We've done B, C, D, E, F. I think we've been through the whole alphabet at this point um, with respect to what that final design will be. Uh, and, and there's been a lot of different moving parts with respect to this. Over the holidays, over the holidays, what we did is we closed off the left-hand turn into southwest first and the left-hand turn into northeast first, and we closed off the through. That right there um, helped as it relates to, and we're going to show you some travel times, clearing out traffic because we're not having that, those turning movements going on. And again, every couple of seconds counts. And the other thing that's important to note as it relates to traffic, and you know, this is, this is frustrating for everybody. I know it's frustrating for everybody, it's frustrating for me when I get stuck in traffic. But there are a lot of things that impact traffic. And when you're driving along a corridor, you're experiencing that traffic at that point of time um, and only that one time. Now, when you drive back again, you're gonna again experience that at what, that one point in time at that point of the day. Um, so, but one of the things that happens throughout the day is that, and I know from, from being here for a very long time, is that sometimes just traffic slows down because traffic slows down. There might be somebody four or five cars ahead of you that's, drawing five, that's driving five miles per hour slower. Well, that changes the flow of traffic. I know when, um, if there's an accident, that changes the flow of traffic. Somebody gets pulled over, that changes the flow of traffic. When it rains in South Florida, everybody slows down, you know, it, it, that people slows down. We have train crossings that slow people down. Um, and we have, whether we're in season or whether we're not in season, and that slows people down. And these things aren't like, well, okay, at nine o'clock, we're gonna have this, this, and this. And at 11 o'clock, we're gonna have this, this, and this. 
This goes up and comes back down. So it adds to travel time and it takes away from travel time. And that's happening throughout the whole day. That's why it's, it's, very, it's, it's frustrating at times that, okay, it took me longer to get from point A to point B. But yesterday, it took me half the time because of these things like this as it relates to traffic flow. The other thing that we have here um, is we have the train. But the train, which has actually been here, I think, before Pompano, because the FEC railroad was actually some of the first ways that people got down from the northeast to the, all the way down south, um, the train, uh, the freight train, and we talked to the FEC and got data specifically from them, their trains are two miles long. And they're two miles long because everybody's ordering for Amazon and using UPS. So, um, uh, and that's gone up because of COVID. Uh, they average a speed of 50 to 60 miles per hour. And I know I've seen them when they're not doing that fast. We've all seen that. But again, like traffic flow, they have that same curve. They don't necessarily have people driving slower, but they will have accidents, and then that slows the trains down, and that has a broader impact because a car is 16 to 18 feet, and this train's two miles long. So that has a greater impact to it. Um, or just traffic on the corridor. Um, we also have Brightline. So, I'm sorry, so that train average, according to what they had to submit to the federal government, for their environmental impact statement, their average time passing an intersection is three to five minutes. So think about what that does to your travel time if you get stuck by a train. The average is three to five minutes. Sometimes it's longer, sometimes it's less, depending on the train. And then when you look at Brightline, the Brightline train is less than 60 seconds from when, you, when the arms go down, the train goes by, and the arms come back up. Now, every time that train goes by and the arms go down, for the bright line, it changes the cycle of the light. I mentioned that before in an, in an earlier meeting. And then when a freight train goes by, it changes the cycle of the light. And it's typically, based on when we talk to the FEC, it's probably two to three, maybe four cycles in order to clear the traffic out. So those are other things that we're dealing with. But um, again, these don't happen the entire day. They happen at points during the day. I'm going to turn the, the, the mic over to Joaquin to talk a little bit about traffic. Exactly. Mayor, uh, commission, uh, Vice Mayor and Commissioners, uh, Joaquin Vargas uh, with Traftech Engineering. I have a series of slides and I'm going to break my presentation into three parts. First, I'm going to talk about travel time comparison before the barricades were installed, all the different changes that have been done. I'm going to talk a little bit about safety, and then I'm going to conclude with some additional things that will be done to bring traffic condition to acceptable conditions. We're still not done. I was asked that before my presentation, I spend at least a minute on, on my credentials, just for the benefit of everybody. I do have a Bachelor's of Science in Civil Engineering, and also a Master's of Science in Traffic and Transportation from Georgia Tech. I've been practicing for 35 years. 33 of those 35 years have been right here in Broward County. And I'm one of few uh, experts in hurricane evacuation. I personally developed the hurricane evacuation plan for the Florida Keys, also assisted with the hurricane evacuation for Florida City, also worked on the one-way Florida Turnpike plan during a major storm between Florida City and Orlando, and also assisted with hurricane evacuation is issues on uh, the West Coast, Marco Island. So with that, let me start with uh, my slides. Um, this is a, a graph that uh, compares travel time runs uh, in the eastbound direction uh, between 7 and 9 in the morning. So this is the typical morning rush hour. And you'll see that uh, the first uh, a point, which is June 2019, we didn't have data there. But don't let that worry, because the afternoon is the more critical, and we do have information there. But the, the second graph is when we first installed the barricades, that was in October. Then in December, there were some changes that were done. So we repeated the travel time runs in the eastbound direction. You can see the, the travel time went down. And then again, we did some additional changes and we did some travel time runs uh, in February uh, of, this, uh, of this year. So th those travel times have, have gone down. I, th this, this is... Um, Eastbound direction in the uh, four to six, this is the PM peak hour. 
One of the important things uh, that I think it's important to know about these travel time runs, this is done during multiple runs. And in order to get a, a clear picture of what the travel time runs, you have to do at least six runs. We, we were able to do more runs, different drivers. There's also a technique that is implemented to be able to get an accurate reading. So you'll see that in yellow, there's a range. So you may be stuck on a bad a condition with a, with a high number. Other times it could be much better, but the average is what, what's really important, which is representative of what happens during the morning rush, rush hour and the afternoon uh, peak period as well. So this is the eastbound direction uh, in the afternoon, uh, four to six. You can see we do have a, a count uh, in June of 2019. That was before all this was implemented. And you, you see that the time have been coming down after we implemented the, uh, uh, the barricades and has continually improved. I think there is no question, and I think everybody has noted that going east, coming from I-95, going east, things are better than before. Uh, and, and clearly the, uh, the travel time runs uh, indicate that when, when you look at the data. This is in the westbound direction, uh, westbound direction in the morning uh, peak period. Again, we didn't have before the barricades information. You'll notice that in, in, De in December, we had a, a certain number of minutes. And then in, in December, we did some changes. It went up. That can happen because we may fix something at one point, but something else may go bad. That's why it's, it's, a, it's a holistic optimization that has to be done for all the different movements and then focusing on where the major problem is. And then in February, we were able to drop it to three minutes and 20, 20 seconds, which is great. In the morning in the westbound direction, uh, we, don't, we don't see any significant issues. That's not the case in the afternoon. We're all aware that the westbound direction from Cyprus to Dixie is a problem. And clearly, uh, this graph uh, indicates that. You'll see that before uh, all this was implemented, it was around three minutes. Then it jumped to nine minutes and 30 seconds, remained there uh, after we did some improvements, and we were able to drop it to seven minutes and 43 seconds. That is still not acceptable. That, that is still not acceptable, uh, but we have made a significant improvement. We're only four and a half minutes away, and, and we believe that we can decrease that to an acceptable condition. I think it's important, uh, Mayor and Commissioners, uh, the fact that when we did the June count, the June is a low traffic volume period for South Florida. This is all well documented by the state. The last set of travel time runs we did was in February, which is the peak of the peak. So we're really not comparing apples and apples, but we do recognize that there's still a problem, there's still some room for improvement, which we believe that we will be able to uh, fix this. This, this uh, let, let me focus now on safety. Um, we have three bars on, on the left side, the blue ones. This is uh, documenting the, the crashes on Atlantic uh, from uh, Northwest 6 to Northeast 7th Avenue. And the three bars is the, the year uh, 2019, Year 2020 is the one in the middle, and then 2021. Clearly, 2020, we know why the crashes went down. That was uh, during the heart of the pandemic. Less people were driving, so there's no surprise there. On the, on the right side of the graph, uh, same thing for Dixie Highway between uh, 2nd Street on the south and MLK on the north. Again, we saw that dip in 2020, and then it uh, in increased again in uh, 2021. One of the important things is that the state um, establishes what's an acceptable level of crashes on similar intersections throughout the state. Now, obviously, one crash is not acceptable, but we cannot have crashes. Unfortunately, th those will happen. But the state has great statistics at, at what is acceptable. Anything above that number then is, is, is a problem. Something has to be done to try to reduce those crashes. This section of Atlantic and Dixie we have almost twice the number of crashes that should be happening here. So if we do some safety enhancements and bring those numbers down to where they should be, that is a significant sa safety improvement for this, for this area. So imagine if we can reduce from 122 crashes to half of that 60, that 60 less crashes should be occurring in, in this section. I'm gonna uh, present a, a short video. Um, uh, about uh, pedestrian crossings, especially regarding school guards. There is a, a, a audio, hopefully you'll be able to hear that.
do they need a crossing guard out here? Because it's too dangerous for the kids, and half the drivers, they don't want to stop. They're making a right turn, and then they pull up and block the crosswalk. So basically, that's why, you know, they need the crossing guards here. One of those uh, crossings was on the west side of Dixie, crossing Atlantic from south to north. That is the, the section that has the, the longest distance for pedestrian crossings, and the, the improvements that we're doing is going to reduce that, which is going to make it much safer for pedestrians. This slide shows on the, on the left side uh, the study intersection, Dixie and Atlantic, and then on the east side, um, Atlantic and, and Federal Highway. Uh, as you know, uh, through Federal Highway, we have two lanes going east, two lanes going west. Uh, the two lanes going west start at the Barrier Island, goes over the Intracoastal Waterway, through Federal Highway, and uh, just shy uh, of Cypress Road. That section was, was reduced to two lanes, I believe, eight years ago. It's been functioning very well. Additional growth has occurred during the last year, and it, it continues to function uh, very well. Uh, one of the things that uh, we're, we're, we also looked at is at Federal Highway, east-west traffic with two lanes going east, two lanes going west, have to conflict with 43,000 vehicles going north and south on Federal Highway. That's a high number. In contrast, at Dixie Highway, the volume that's going north and south is, is approximately 26,000. So we have a lot less vehicles conflicting at Dixie Highway than at Federal Highway. So. Here's the, the, the final optimization. As I stated, we're, we're four and a half minutes away. Uh, clearly, that is not acceptable. Here are some of the things that we're going to do to bring this, the, the last piece of the puzzle, which is westbound Atlantic from Cyprus to Dixie to an acceptable condition. First thing we're going to do is we're going we're to add a second northbound left turn lane. That's North Dixie Highway, turning left to go west towards I-95. The second bullet is adding a second left turn lane going southbound Dixie Highway, turning left to go east on Atlantic towards, towards the beach. In addition to that, add a south right turn lane, south Dixie Highway, turning right to go west towards I-95. What, what does that allow us to do? And, and Paul did steal my thunder, the, the power of two seconds. That allows us to transfer um, somewhere between eight and 12 seconds from Dixie Highway without degradating Dixie Highway. We, we need to make sure that Dixie Highway stays at its current level, perhaps improve it a little bit more than it is today. But transferring those seconds to Atlantic Boulevard, and which is going to make a significant improvement uh, to, that, to that, that corridor, especially in the westbound direction, the critical uh, section, which is between Cyprus and, uh, um, and Dixie Highway. This is the, the optimized plan. Um, and uh, this, this, uh, this is the, the final configuration without all the cones, uh, and, and Paul talked about all the problems that the cone caused. As you can see, we have uh, safety is going to be improved. We have much wider uh, median for, for landscape improvements. This one includes all of the improvements that I mentioned, 
It also includes some additional improvements we're doing in the eastbound direction. Remember the, the, the travel time runs that I, that, I, that I shared, where eastbound is better than before, and we're going to make it even better with some additional improvements we're doing uh, at Cyprus and, and Atlantic, including some, some lengthening of, of turn lanes. And with all these improvements, uh, we believe that we're going to bring the last section, the last piece of the puzzle, uh, where the, pr the current problem is between Cyprus and Dixie Highway to an acceptable condition. So, you know, I think there's a, there's a couple things that I wanted to kind of go back over related to fixing the safety of, of what goes on in this intersection. Um, you know, we talked about the, the physical improvements. Um, it's, as you can see, it is still a major intersection, um, but we have reduced um, the, the traffic, excuse me, we have slowed the traffic down but not stopped traffic by doing these improvements. Again, the power of two seconds. And I, I told Commissioner Floyd I would do this. We got all the ingredients now to make those cookies that I talked about on that earlier um, uh, presentation because through this process since October, we have tested multiple times. We've collected the data. We've tested, we have collected counts. And we have all of the information that we need right now to make this optimized design. The engineers don't even have this that are doing the final design work. This is something that Joaquin and I have worked through and that this will then be transmitted to the, the engineers because we'll ha we have all the information that we need to kind of to move on. And I think that's important to note. There's another thing that I, that I regrettably did not get a chance to say. When we talk about creating safety for the pedestrians, one of the comments that we've heard um, is that, well, let's just put a pedestrian overpass uh, the intersection. Well, pedestrian overpasses don't really improve safety because one, they're not used, they're very expensive. They work when you have something like the tri roll corridor where you physically cannot get across the tracks because there's a four foot fence in between the tracks and there's a, an, ele an elevation difference. You see them on 95. Um, if, I can, if I can see where I'm going and I can physically walk there, uh, it's proven that I'm going to walk there instead of going up, coming down. I got to go up an escalator. I got to go up an elevator. I got to climb two sets of stairs because I got to get high enough. Um, they work in places like Minneapolis because they can connect building to building. Um, so you don't see a lot of um, pedestrian overpasses down in South Florida, except maybe over 995. And the and the people that are there's not a lot of people walking across. I-95, we certainly don't want to do that. So, so calming the traffic and changing the character of the roadway is what is so important, and, and a pedestrian overpass does not facilitate that at all. So that was, another, that was another comment that I meant to say earlier when we looked at that big intersection. Um, we have some next steps. Because we have all the ingredients to, to make our cookies, Commissioner Floyd, um, we have everything that we need to know. We are recommending that the delineators come down in a phased approach. So we need to coordinate with BSO, um, but the idea is to take out all those posts, change the striping to back the way it was, uh, because we're done with our testing. We know what we need to do at this point. We'll optimize the streetscape plans with the engineers. Um, we expect that the delineators will be out we're looking at some dates within the next month. Um, again, it'll be two steps. Um, so I think that's gonna, that's gonna help quite a bit at this point. We're gonna optimize the streetscape plans. Uh, and then we're looking to start construction um, later at some time this year for the improvements. But we're gonna start on Dixie North because it's Dixie improvements and Atlantic improvements. So we're talking about looking at Dixie first and going, working our way south. Uh, and then we have to coordinate those improvements of the optimized design with the FEC because the FEC has to make some safety improvements as well within the intersection. And when I was in do, doing work in Oakland Park, things like they put the double pedestrian uh, 
post down. So you'd have the one arm that comes down for the cars, and then several, several feet behind it, you have another arm that comes down for the pedestrians. And they have to do some grading changes, and they have to align the crossing arms with the new roadway alignment. So when that happens, that's when the contractor can come in and work while they're working on their intersection improvements. So, um, so again, the delineators are going to come down. We're going to take. We're going to change the striping back to the way it was. Uh, we're going to optimize the design, uh, and then we'll look to uh, begin construction later this year. So, we'll turn it back to Suzette. Suzette Civil Assistant City Manager once again. Um, so, I just want to take this opportunity to um, bring our presentation full circle. Um, I think the, the, what the screen's showing is a, a great graphic. It's demonstrating all of the issues that we've all dealt with for decades um, in the city. We've had blight, we have unsafe conditions, we have lack of walkability, lack of connectivity, um, and uh, various issues. And as you can see, the one missing puzzle piece is for us to continue to move forward with our transformative Dixie and Atlantic Boulevard improvements. And we just need to put that one puzzle piece in place and it will allow us to move forward and realize the vision for our new downtown. And I really think that this is going to be very transformative for the city, economically speaking, in particular for the Northwest. I've heard for years, you know, look at what we've done on the beach. When are we going to do that for our Northwest community? And this is really the catalyst. We need to make the improvements to Dixie and Atlantic Boulevard happen. It's the catalyst for attracting private sector um, investment in the area and to have the nice restaurants that we have on the beach, the beautiful retail, residential, multifamily, office space, etc. So we really want to try and move this initiative forward um, this evening as well. Just to end, just revisiting some of the conceptuals we looked at earlier. Again, this is looking down um, um, First Avenue, I think, towards the Cultural Center. <laughs> this is there. This is along Flagler Avenue, um, looking southeast um, along Flagler Avenue, out to the Cultural Center also. And finally, just to leave you with, this is an overall conceptual rendering for the area. You see um, Dixie, at Dixie Atlantic intersection. You see going east, going on Atlantic. You have the beautiful landscape medians, um, safer for our children and our crossing guards to get across. Um, safer for all of the competing interests to use the intersection of Atlantic and Dixie. So now we'll make it safe, not just for the cars to use Atlantic for thoroughfare speeding to I-95, but to finding that harmony for the cars, the pedestrians, the trains, and the children to use that inter intersection safely. And that completes our presentation, subject to your questions. Thank you, Mayor.